I'm excited about class this morning. Let me tell you why. I've thought long and hard about how to introduce the two people I get to interview. And the logical way it seems to me is to tell you that come June of this year, there's going to be a birthday of a little girl named Ebba. She is going to be three years old. She just happens to be the coolest kid, the most marvelous, the smartest, most beautiful, most talented, most incredible child that Becky, that, 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 that you and I have ever known, met, or dreamed of. Yes, she is our grandchild. <laughs> and and uh, she happens to have uh, two sets of grandparents. Uh, Becky and I are on one side, but on the other side are Janet and Dennis Danielson. And so Dennis is, come on up, Dennis. Dennis is here, so he's my son's father-in-law, and he happens to be a world-class specialist in John Milton. He has recently retired from teaching at the University of British Columbia. He has his PhD from Stanford. He is uh, 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 the Texas Tech of the West. He has... Um, <laughs> Lives in Victoria, up near Vancouver, the Texas Tech of the Northwest. I mean, he's just really tied in in so many ways to things of value. And, and, and so Dennis and Janet, Janet is, where's Janet? Janet is right there. Janet is a world-class composer and, and pianist, and I will not make her play the piano, but it was really tempting. But would you join me in welcoming them? <laughs> Dennis. Thank you. Grab the seat of your choice. So I want to interview Dennis, but while we keep it all in the family, so Dennis has a first cousin who has a son that makes this son Dennis's first cousin once removed, which makes this son Ebba's second cousin once removed. Right. And his name is Bruce Hindmarsh. So Bruce was our lecturer last night and the feature of our panel on Friday at the library. Bruce is a professor of spiritual theology and development, has his PhD from Oxford in theology, and is at Regent College up in Vancouver. He's headed from us to Baylor where he'll be speaking over the next couple of days. But he has stayed around uh, for this class, though we've got, to, we've got to get him out of here right after this class to make his other commitments. But would you join me? Oh, and his wife, Carolyn. Carolyn, stand up, please. Carolyn, yeah, yeah. She teaches New Testament Greek. So like, you know, she's got the best job of anybody. But meanwhile, uh, uh, I'll let her keep her seat, uh, uh, but would you join me in welcoming Bruce Hindmarsh, Dr. Bruce Hindmarsh. Thank you. So Bruce, uh, grab the seat. Why don't you take that one? Okay. Um, so here's the way we're going to do this interview. I want to talk to them in basically three clumps. I want you to get to know a little bit about them personally. But then I want them to talk about their fields of specialty. And I'm going to deviate a little bit from what they spoke on this weekend. And I want to go to a different area of their specialty. And then we're going to close with some personal things uh, uh, that, that pertain to spiritual growth and things like that. So let's start with uh, getting to know everybody. Um, Dennis, your wife Janet over there, how did you meet and how did you fall in love? Well, we fell in love, to start with that one, uh, kind of at different times. I fell in love first. <laughs> uh, took Janet quite a while to fall in love, but I, I worked really hard on it. Um, but the truth is, and this, this goes down really well at academic cocktail parties, we met in a Baptist Sunday school class. Whoosh! Whoosh. So we're going to take this moment, I want you to continue, but anybody who's single, raise your, no, I'm joking, <laughs> keep going. <coughs> so yeah, we met, met in a Baptist Sunday school class, and uh, after 
a good number of years of knowing each other, uh, we finally got engaged. And I mean, it, this all started really early, early teens, literally. And then we got married when Janet was 19 and I was 20. And that was, uh, as of this coming week, 49 years ago. Ah! Do you like her? Uh, more all the time. <laughs> Seriously, more all the time. Um, I'm still working on getting her to like me. <laughs> uh, but, you know, she's a, wo a woman who takes on big projects. And so when she met me, I think she saw potential for somebody who needed some straightening out. <laughs> And she's still working on that project. It's, it's been a, a project for a while. But truly, uh, it, that marriage has been, I guess, the number one human blessing in my life. And uh, we have four children, one of whom got mentioned, uh, the, father, uh, the, the mother of Eva. And then we have uh, three other children as well, Eva, Jessa, and John, who are in their 30s. And you have got other grandchildren. You've like... Uh, uh, I've got two other grandchildren, cousins of Ebba. Yes. So we've all got that claim to fame. Rosalie, let's go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, Ella and Rosalie, uh, whom uh, Ebba refers to collectively as Ella Roro. Ella Roro. So, all right, before we leave this and move to Bruce, if you could give us one key to maintaining a happy and blessed marriage for 49 years, what would it be? Just never, never give up. <laughs> Janet's never given up on me, uh, but seriously, persistence and um, belief that there's a world outside the very present moment because life is full of little crises that make you think I just, this isn't going to work. But the, the nature of a marriage commitment is that it's long term. All right, excellent. Okay, shift to your first cousin, second, or once removed. Uh, Bruce, tell us a little bit about your family and why don't you start telling us how you uh, uh, fell in love and, and got the delightful Carolyn to marry you. Okay. Well, Carolyn and I were at college together, and uh, we say that God smiled when we passed in the hallway because we didn't really get to know each other there. And it was later working at Youth for Christ that I kind of thought uh, a, a Christian um, youth ministry. We were both working in the office. A little more volume on him. Whoa. Thank you. All right. Go ahead. That um, I thought uh, I thought pretty highly of this young woman, and being a little bit timid, I would send her notes that would be, you know, I didn't just directly ask her out, but I gave her multiple choice options. You know, <laughs> would you like to go to an automatic car wash? A, would you like to go for dinner or a drop dead creep? And um, <laughs> she never chose the last one, and so gradually um, we got to know each other and fall in love, and. Um, you know, thinking of the library, there's a very special book in our library, which is when I got up the courage to ask Carolyn to, to marry me, I, um, I got a book, the Oxford Book of English Verse, and Dennis might be appalled that I defaced the book in this way, but I, I carved out of the pages to put the ring inside the book, you know, and, um, and, and I, I thought, okay, I've got this, it's, it's perfect, I've got the ring, it's in the book, and I opened it up, and the page facing it, the poem was John Donne, The Funeral. <laughs> so, 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 I, so I kept cutting until I got to John Donne, The Ecstasy. <laughs> Much better. But I wrote all these things in the flyleaf, you know, sometimes the book has a way of changing your life. I hope you get a lot out of this book and so on. And so that's the book I gave to her that... Um, oh, that's <laughs> pretty... And, and you've kept the book. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, anybody who's watching this, where do they buy those books? Where can they get a copy in case they need to do that? Is that uh, readily available still? Um, what I asked Dennis, and by the way, Dennis had no knowledge I was going to ask him this. I'm, I'm throwing these guys some, some curveballs that they don't know are coming. Um, and so uh, uh, you'll have to excuse them if, if uh, I'm unfair to them in that way. Give us a trait of Carolyn 
that you particularly admire and that stands out to you as something that's really special? Oh. You know, I, you, you take for granted things that you just get to live with. Do we have sound? Are we all right? No, we don't have sound for you. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to, we're going to change you. I'm going to, I'll, yeah, you, you're good at holding a mic up. You okay. Just hold the mic up. How is that? Is that Yes, better? swallow the mic. Okay. There you go. There we are. All right, a trait of Carolyn's. But one of the things um, that I get to enjoy about Carolyn so much and that uh, I have to not take for granted is I've met nobody who listens the way Carolyn listens. People feel like you have her whole attention. And it's just a, such a wonderful gift to give somebody, to, be, to, to give them your full attention, to feel like you've been entirely listened to. And um, I feel like uh, all the years I've known Carolyn, I've always known that I have her attention and her loving interest. And it's a wonderful gift that she gives to people. She's become a kind of spiritual friend and director to so many of our students. And I think it's because she has that capacity to be present some, to somebody and completely absorbed in somebody, you know? Yeah. So. yeah. All right. Three children. Tell us briefly about those. Uh, we have three children. Um, they're all in their 20s. Uh, beautiful young adults. Uh, Bethany, uh, who was born um, three weeks before we went to Oxford. So my doctorate and our family started at the same time. It's quite an adventure. And then uh, two boys who are also born, uh, born in Oxford, uh, Matthew and Sam. They all live in the kind of Vancouver area. And uh, so we're delighted to have these three uh, young adult children. Okay. And uh, the oldest, Bethany, yes. is the poet. Yes. Yes. We studied poetry a lot in Lubbock yeah. at Texas Tech. <laughs> and one of my favorite poems was, um, you can tell her this in case it inspires her, Roses are red. All right. Violets are blue. Very good. Most poems rhyme, but this one doesn't. There you go. That's like cutting edge poetry. There it is. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, in the process of this, you both came upon a relationship with God. And I, I think everybody would love to hear how that became something real in your life. So, uh, Bruce, you're holding the microphone up close. You go first. Dennis, you go second, please. Okay. Um, I grew up within a Christian family where I had the example of my parents who were genuine believers, and I knew that they loved the Lord Jesus. And it was a natural thing to, um, to uh, want to learn to pray and want to call out to Christ. And I feel like I remember praying a sinner's prayer as a young child and inviting Christ into my life. But as I look back, I think, um, well, you know, I remember once my daughter asking, asking my daughter, um, um, you know, um, about um, when we were living in, um, in Saskatchewan and about, um, you know, whether, you know, she had been invited to, uh, you know, invite Christ into her life. And she said, yes. And I said, just keep opening up your heart because every year there'll be more to give. And I feel like that's part of my experience growing up is, is every year as you grow, there's more to learn to give to Christ. And, um, and as I grew up within a Christian home, I feel like I needed also to, um, to ask questions, to know that this faith was my faith. And there's a way that I don't think I even realized at the time that I was becoming a scholar, in a sense, by having doubts and needing to explore them and finding that Christ was always sufficient for those questions. There was always more to discover about Christ. And as I had doubts or I had questions, that I could take those and I could go deeper. So I think there's a way, there's a kind of gradual formation of finding that as there's more to me to give to Christ, I needed to go deeper, and as I had deeper questions, Christ was equal to those, and that's the kind of process for me of, um, in each of life's crises, in each of life's moments, being able to turn to Christ and find that he's more than sufficient for all that we need. Fantastic. Amen. Um, <clears throat> Dennis, uh, uh, I'd love for you to tell us how you came to faith, and then I may probe you in a little more detail about some of that. Like Bruce, I grew up in a Christian family. There you go. And was taken to church and Sunday school and those good things. Um, I, I was baptized at the age of 13 after coming forward at a special series of services that we had at church. I took the faith very seriously. I think the, the, 
the turning points in my faith were moments of, of deep crisis. So a year after my baptism, um, and don't laugh, those of you who own dogs know what it's like when you lose a dog. My best friend of six years, a dog, died, and I spent more time reading the Bible in those weeks before and after her death than I ever had before. And I, I, I took it to the Lord, and I didn't receive any great revelation, but it, it strangely, the crisis, the pain deepened my faith. And it drove me, it drove me to the Lord. Um, the, the same thing happened more profoundly seven years later when my sister died in a traffic accident. Hold the mic up. <clears throat> Sorry. And uh, so the loss of my sister and, and the tremendous pain to my whole family, um, it was a crisis of faith, but I can't imagine my faith now without any of that having happened. So as I, as I like to say, the joys of life and the sorrows of life are both very real and they don't cancel each other out. So my, my faith in God has, has partly, one of the things that helped me work through that is becoming a scholar, you know, an egghead, and, so that I could take issues related to faith and, and hold them at arm's length, see what other people had done with them, how they'd wrestled with issues, not just people contemporary with us, but in the past, and seeing how they'd come through their dark valleys and that helped me come through some of my dark valleys. There have been others, but those, those are two of them. So one of the areas in which you've become um, an authority is the area of Milton yeah. and the, the issues associated with the problem of evil yeah. and, and things of that nature. Do you see, would you have been as interested and would it have captured you so well if you had not experienced these tragic losses in life? Oh, not at all. It was these tragic losses that, that drove me to the study of the works of Milton, particularly that big, long poem, Paradise Lost, which some of you know, which was written 300-odd years ago, 350 years ago, um, which is a story about the fall of humankind. It's the story of Adam and Eve and Satan, and disobedience to God. And Paradise Regained, in some ways, is a separate poem, but there's also Paradise Regained within that, within that poem. So the, the crises of my own life, the, the profundity, really, of my own doubts drove me into that exploration, that it energized my academic study. All right, Bruce, part of your academic study has been, uh, Bruce currently teaches at, at Regent College, and, and if you had not been uh, here, uh, you would be uh, at home getting ready for class tomorrow or whatever, and, and you're teaching a class on the history of spiritual, Christian spiritual thought or spirituality. Yeah. Um, I, I, I want to know what drove you into that area of interest, but the best way to do it is for you to first Tell us what the area of interest is. Okay. The word spirituality, uh, Mark and I were talking about this. The word spirituality today can be a kind of plastic word. It, it connotes much, but denotes little. It's kind of, it's evocative, but people lack the power of definition. So just very briefly, um, uh, the scholar Gordon Fee, one of my former colleagues at Regent, um, great scholar of, um, of, of the Pauline literature, the Epistles of Paul. One of the best commentaries on 1 Corinthians. Go okay, ahead. Okay, well, well, he argues in his kind of big book on the Holy Spirit and Paul that St. Paul invented the term spirituality, pneumaticos, and uh, to be a spiritual person. And that in a way, when pneumaticos, the word spiritual, appears in the New Testament, it should have a capital P. It should be capital S, Spirit, that spirituality is life in the Holy Spirit. And it's the specific Holy Spirit that Jesus Christ poured out at Pentecost. And it's not just generic spirituality. So it's life in the Holy Spirit. 
So when we talk about the history of spirituality or spiritual theology, it's really about the experience of the faith, the lived experience of the faith. So a lot of what I have the opportunity to teach students is to help them go back through the centuries and see what it's meant for life in the Holy Spirit, for people to have genuinely lived the faith, not just thought the faith or taught the faith, but genuinely lived the faith under the real conditions of life, which have changed over the centuries. There have been different challenges at different times. And so I'm teaching a class right now on the history of Christian spirituality, and really what we're trying to see is our brothers and sisters uh, in the past, what are the challenges that they faced, and how have they sought to live out of that union with the Holy Spirit, that union with Jesus Christ, the very highest ideals. And so we'll look at the way, you know, the first three centuries of the church, what captures their imagination in living the Christian life is, I want to bear witness to Jesus Christ. In a hostile world, I want to bear witness, and if need be, I will bear witness with my body. I will lay down my life in faith that he will raise it up again. And so the first kind of uh, generation, the word witness itself, martus, comes to mean witness unto death. And uh, so it's the age of the martyrs. And so we'll go through different generations and try to see how this can help us get perspective today by listening to the past on what it means to be wise in the present. Because one of the things about modern life today is we tend to be um, ahistorical, kind of live without a, a really living memory of the past. And I feel like one of the things I get to do is to reintroduce people to what it means to live with enriched dialogue with the Christian past. Imagine if, you know, you go to a Bible study and you feel like, um, boy, I came away learning so much more than I would have if I just looked at the Bible by myself by listening to the insights of my brothers and sisters. Well, imagine if you could have the insights of different generations all the way back down through the centuries and have them kind of weighing in on what Scripture means for your life today. So I feel like that's kind of what I get to do is, is um, and I get to get to, you know, the, the lives of the saints, some of the, the great figures in Christian history. I get to introduce people to these and what that might mean for life today. Okay, so favorite uh, Christian figure in history for you? Oh, that's a tough one. I, um, hmm. I think right now, the one that comes to mind, I'll just say, but is Bernard of Clairvaux, and he's a 12th century Cistercian monk. But like nobody I know, he writes about what it means to love God and what it means to love God most of all. And most of what he wrote was about love. And it was in the midst of a culture that, unlike ours today, was preoccupied with sex and violence. Um, <laughs> And so it's kind of 12th century France. It's the chivalric period, and it's, you know, the knights fighting and jousting and competing and so on, and the love of an unmarried woman. And in that culture of love, he wrote about what the real adventure is, where what it means to enter into the real warfare, which is the warfare of the soul, and what the real love adventure is to be in love with Jesus Christ. And so everything he wrote was about love and what it means for our loves to be rightly ordered, to love God most of all, and then everything else for God's sake. Amen. That uh, reminds me so much of what Coach Max, where's Coach Max? He's over here something There is working through with the men's Bible studies right now, and the men's group of, of working through this idea of, of spiritual warfare and what it means to, to do that. That's a, that's a good word. Um, okay, so now with that, how did you find this as an area of interest what, what, what did God, I'm convinced God uses our lives and, and shapes and molds us to become who we are. And so what were the things that where God was working in your life to turn you into someone who could learn these things and pass them on? Um, I think part of what happened is um, I talk about being ahistorical and just living life in the present without any reference to the past. That was me. And even through college and even beginning in ministry, I had no sense of that. And then I went, I went to Regent College as a, as a graduate student with Carolyn. We were just married for a year. We had lots of questions. We'd written them all out in the back of a napkin. And we kind of took our napkin and went back to school with all these questions and just needing to know more what it is to live the Christian life, what it is to come to know Christ. And, and, and Regent College had a number of these professors like J.I. Packer and Jim Houston and Klaus Bockmuehl and these wonderful professors and something about their European heritage 
it seemed like every course was taught within the perspective of the history, the history coming at it. And I just felt like this, like why has this secret been kept from me all my life? And so maybe there's something about coming to it later in life and finding this is so helpful, this is what I needed to know, this is so perspective giving. I had no idea that this would turn into a day job. I was just learning and being blessed by this. In fact, we went back and I worked back at Youth for Christ for a year and we were trying to discern God's leading. But as I was asked to, asked to be a teacher and I needed more training, we ended up going to Oxford and I struggled with, is it okay to study church history rather than make church history? <laughs> is that okay? And, uh, but gradually I came to realize that just like at Youth for Christ, working in youth ministry, our desire was to see people's lives changed by the gospel, that in teaching church history, and uh, now I'm teaching graduate students, in teaching church history um, and teaching that tradition, I'm seeing people's lives changed by the gospel too. And so it's really a continuous Amen. vocation, I think. Wonderful. So speaking of teaching, um, uh, I'm, Dennis, I'm taking it back to you. You've got a life where you've really spent your life trying to understand God within the framework of the evil we see in the world. So um, uh, give us the one, two, three of why the problem of evil is a problem of evil, and then I'll do a follow-up question. Okay, just very, very simply, uh, the, the, what's called the theological problem of evil can be summed up in three statements, which I hope all of you believe. God is omnipotent, all-powerful. God is wholly good, number two. Number three, there is evil in the world. You all know that. And then the philosophical question is, if one and two are true, if God is omnipotent and there is evil in the world, how can you say he's wholly good? Or if you acknowledge that there's evil in the world and that God is wholly good, how can you say that he's omnipotent? Or if he's omnipotent and wholly good, how can there be evil in the world? So it's a kind of, I guess, trilemma rather than dilemma. And philosophically, philosophers and theologians have tried to tackle that question in that bare bones form. It's not the limitation of the problem of evil. It's the, pro, evil's a problem, not just for philosophers and theologians, but that is the bare bones. So uh, that leaves us to the natural follow-up question. You've struggled with this since Mitzi, your dog, died at the age of 14, yeah. 13, 14. Um, you've studied through this academically. You've studied and taught through Milton and, and others as, as you've addressed this. You've written on this. Give us your insight into the trilemma. Well, Shakespeare's Hamlet says there are more things in heaven and earth than are contained in your philosophy. And so somebody with philosophical interests has to come at this with a kind of humility. So I don't pretend to have solved the problem of evil, the theological problem of evil. But I think studying it has given me a deeper understanding of maybe how God exercises him, his omnipotence and how he exercises his goodness. It's also deepened my understanding, which is still very incomplete, of the nature of evil in the world, be it natural evil, earthquakes and floods and that sort of thing, broken levees and, and human evil. The, the evils that we commit and the evils that we fall into and that become habitual. And so I see if there's a solution to this trilemma, it's, it's beyond a simple rational explanation of, of each of those things. It has to reach out and encourage us to fix our eyes on God with us, Emmanuel. God who has become one of us and shared the evil in this world. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. It's in that incarnation that 
a solution has to be found, even though I can't fully articulate that solution. That's the direction in which I would point. Look at it from a, Bruce, uh, from a historical perspective of spirituality. Um, I, Dennis has, has given us his conceptual idea, can't solve all of the trilemma, but we know the direction in which we should be looking for insight into the trilemma, if not total solution. Um, how does that fit into the world of spiritual thought, uh, historical spiritual thought that, that you've spent so much time with? Let me just give you one example from a text I was reading with students this week. Um, the 14th century was one of the um, most difficult times in Western history in terms of the bubonic plague, uh, wiping out populations and the kind of suffering where suddenly somebody could be taken with this and die an excruciating death. People are dying all around you. Uh, life is uh, pre-analgesic, pre-anaseptic, and pre-anesthetic. People hurt most of the time. Life is difficult. Uh, in terms of warfare, in terms of uh, uh, economic uh, um, uh, collapse. It's a, it's a difficult time in Western civilization. And there's this woman, uh, Julian of Norwich in 14th century England, and um, she had a near-death experience. And she had been praying that she'd be able to come to more appreciate Christ's passion, Christ's suffering. And she had prayed this for many years. I don't know if sometimes you've had a prayer, you've prayed for years and years and years. But she prayed that she'd be able to enter more into Christ's suffering and understand it more personally. And that she had this near-death experience where she talks about like her body kind of freezing, whether she had a kind of paralysis or a stroke or something. And uh, the, the, the priest is there holding the crucifix in her face for last rites. And so she's seeing the kind of Christ on the cross. And it's like everything goes black and there's just a little halo effect around the cross, and as she has this kind of vision, this kind of the revelations of divine love, people call the book, I'm not sure if that was the title that was given to it earlier, but she has this vision of Christ on the cross, and she wondered, and she recovered from this illness, but she saw, oh, sacred head now wounded, she saw Christ's suffering. And what the interesting thing was, she didn't just have an experience and then somebody put her up on stage to give her testimony. For 20 years, she thought about it. For 20 years, she thought, and her question was, what was my Lord's meaning? And she ponders this, and actually, it looks like she actually became a bit of a theologian, and, and she studied, what was my Lord's meaning in this? And she came to see that everything was in the cross, seeing Christ crucified. It's what Dennis is saying. Everything, and the meaning of the world, the meaning of the suffering, broken world, everything is in the cross. She saw the whole world in the cross. She saw the, the love of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in the cross. And if this is God, if this is God dying and suffering for me, then she said, what was my Lord's meaning? Love was his meaning. It's in love he made the world. It's in love he redeemed the world. And love is far more fundamental to the world than we ever realized. That, that he made anything at all, that he made beings to be blessed with his blessedness when he didn't need to that he entered into it on the cross, suffering like that for me. And Julian became, in a sense, one of the great doctors of the church in teaching us out of her experience of, of, uh, of suffering in a world that was suffering, to be able to bear witness in that world to say that the meaning of the world is love, is the love of God. And where do we see that? Um, just keep looking at the cross, and that's where you'll see everything. Yeah. Amen. So. Within the framework of this, uh, you're both uh, uh, men of music to some degree. Uh, uh, Dennis, at least, has, has married uh, into music uh, uh, rather richly. Um, favorite hymn or church song? I'd be interested in, in hearing. So, uh, Dennis? That, that one's easy for me, uh, and this goes back to my boyhood. I used to sing this with great gusto and be furious if they said we're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4. <laughs> and that's Charles Wesley's hymn, And Can It Be That I Should Gain an Interest in My Savior's Blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be? that thou, my God, shouldst die for me. And the third verse, by the way, that often got left out is the one with the wonderful prison imagery. 
Uh, my, thine eye diffused a quickening array, I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Uh, that stirred my soul, and it still does. Hmm. Amen. Okay, so that was Charles Wesley, the musical half of the brothers. Um, uh, where would you go for your, your song or hymn, Bruce? Well, it changes from time to time. I'm actually going to say one um, different than I said earlier this morning, but uh, the hymn Amazing Grace is a, is a truly outstanding, um, outstanding song written by John Newton, 18th century hymn writer. And uh, I wrote a, a book on John Newton. I found the manuscripts where he wrote the hymn, uh, his diary when he wrote the hymn, and the sermon that he preached on the occasion when he wrote the hymn, and so on. And um, what's come to mean more to me about that hymn, because it, it can be seen as kind of a song of testimony, and as you may know, it's been described as the spiritual national anthem of America, and how people in, in, in intuitively reach for that in times of crisis. You know, after the Challenger disaster, people sang it. After a school shooting, you find prayer circles and people gather to sing it. After 9-11, there's people gathering, holding hands and singing Amazing Grace. And the really interesting thing is the song is very, it's about the grace, um, it, 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 it expresses gratitude for grace, but people are singing it as a prayer for grace. You know, and there's some versions of the hymn where people have revised it and been offended by the word wretch, and they say, <laughs> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved and strengthened me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved someone like me. But when you really have encountered the wretchedness of life, when you're really dealing with the problem of evil and know that it's real, you're very happy to talk about wretchedness and know that you need grace. And I think that's one of the things in the whole evangelical tradition that's meant so much to me is the simple message that God has done for us what we cannot do for ourselves. What you may not know is when John Newton wrote the hymn, it wasn't actually just a personal testimony. The words in the first instance are the words of King David. It was set to First Chronicles 17, 16, and 17, I think it is, where Nathan comes to the prophet David. David wanted to build a house for God, and Nathan says, no, God's going to build your house, your dynasty. And David says, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And so John Newton, in writing this hymn for his poor people in Olney, is saying... Um, the grace of God that was there for David and is there for us through the greater son of David that was there for me in my life as I was saved as a uh, converted slave trader and saved out of my own wretchedness is there for you today. And so what a wonderful thing that this hymn has come to encompass, um, uh, you know, it ha has had such a long history and come to encompass so many experiences of wretchedness where we know that we need grace. It's the basic human condition. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's wonderful. So um, we've got just a couple of minutes left. Uh, favorite book? Give me a favorite book. Or, no, let's do it this way. If you could recommend to folks out there to read one book, and it can't be one y'all have written. Uh, um, and it can't, Christianity on trial? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, it can't be one I've written. Um, uh, what one book or, or piece would you recommend uh, to, to, to folks who are listening and watching? Well, a book I used to reread every Christmas, and I've, re -read, I've read many, many times. It, it's an old book. You won't be surprised as a historian. That's an old book. Um, but Augustine's Confessions. And one of the astonishing things about that book is that across the centuries, across the many, many centuries, the millennia, is it continues to address you directly with a kind of psychological directness and identifying with this question of uh, how do I set my soul at rest, you know? Is uh, the kind of restless heart that Augustine, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God. And it's a story of where do my desires and my longings terminate? And where can I find rest? And you trace his journey. And, and, the, and the entire book is written as a prayer. It's written to God in the form of a prayer. And he's talking to God. And, um, and he actually ends with a meditation on the Sabbath. 
uh, indicating where our proper rest is, that our rest is found in, in God himself. And it's just, um, I feel like it's the story of each of us. He has his own experience of uh, being in a garden and experiencing a fall and, uh, and, and recovery by grace. It's uh, uh, um, one of the great conversion stories in the Christian church. It's one of the great stories of, um, of longing for God and, uh, and finding God come and meet you at your point of need. So um, Augustine's Confessions, I think. All right, yeah. Dennis. Uh, just, uh, I'm, I'm an academic, so I'm going to do a footnote before I answer your question. Augustine's Confessions is actually the first autobiography in history. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's worth reading just, for, just on that account. So I can't say Augustine's Confessions because Bruce has already said it. So I'm going to go to something more recent. And uh, it's probably in the 1950s, a little book was written called Your God is Too Small by J.B. Phillips. Uh, that was formative in my life. When I, just as I said the other day, when I was 19 years old, one summer I was living in Bruce's parents' basement in Toronto uh, where I was working, and it was a, a nice thin book. As I get older, I like nice thin books. Um, so just advertisement. Some of you own the little book that I published last year called The Tao of Right and Wrong. That's a, a nice thin book. You can, you can read it in two sittings, and if you haven't done so yet, it's on your homework list. Um, but J.B. Phillips, Your God is Too Small, kind of shocked me out of the sort of complacency that one often has in one's youth or even late youth. You know, you've, been, you've grown up in one particular church and with all the blessings that have come with that, your view of God is, it, it sort of fits within the four walls of that church or that Sunday school class. And uh, it, it just gave me, a, it was a sort of shock therapy. Oh, God is bigger than that. God is more mysterious than that. God is more challenging than that. Maybe God is more demanding than that. And it sort of opened my mind and my heart to keeping an eye open for really how big God is in life, in this amazing universe that he's allowed us to be part of. So, yes. So we are, we are out of time, um, but before uh, I say a blessing over uh, the class and, and we go our separate ways and get you guys on the road. Um, uh, uh, give us a 30, 45 second blessing of where you believe that the church needs to have its eyes fixed. Where do we need to be headed? And, and, and I'll give you an example is, is um, uh, I'm convinced we need to grow in our depth and awareness of who God is and what difference he makes in our world. And as we know God more fully, uh, uh, it will impact us and who we are. That's kind of what we're doing right now in our class when we don't have honored guests to interview. Uh, but, but within the framework of where God's moving in your heart, what you see in the world at large, what you see within the church, what word would you give us of, of a direction to move? Um, what's come to mind, it's, you know, it's a, a, a phrase I remember a preacher saying, um, don't tell God how big your problems are, tell your problems how big God is. And I think to recapture, I mean, the problems of life, we experience them, they can be devastating, and we can be left not knowing where to turn. But again and again, the biblical picture is Christ is exalted. It's the doctrine of the ascension. He reigns and he pours out the Holy Spirit and he is sufficient. And to recapture in the midst of confusing times, uh, in, in when life is difficult, to just recapture this sense of Christ's exaltation, the fullness of Christ, the sufficiency of Christ, the exaltation of Christ. And I, to have that vision, we were in, Carol and I were in Rome uh, for um, about a month last year. And uh, it's, it's amazing to see, you know, the triumphal arch that emperors would build when they come back, Constantinian's arch, the arch of Severus, the arch of Titus, that kind of commemorates their victories. And then when the churches, when they began to build their basilica, what did they have right over the altar? 
where the communion is celebrated, it is the triumphal arch that separates the nave from the chancel. And you see the single solitary believer comes and for communion stands under uh, the sense of Christ's victory. And that that's the perspective giving thing is he stands exalted for all time and he, will, he has been sufficient for past generations. He'll be sufficient for us. He'll be sufficient for our children. And to have that vision of Christ's sufficiency and fullness, as Paul calls it in the book of Colossians. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Dennis? Wow. That's a hard little act to follow. And I appreciate what, what Bruce just said. I just I say amen to what he has said. Um, I think the church needs to interpenetrate. I, I love the walls of the church. It's a wonderful gathering place for us. Uh, but somehow the connection between what we do in church and what we do outside of church needs, needs to be energized. I don't know how to do that. I'm looking for ways, trying to think of ways to do that. God is God of the universe as well as of my spiritual life. And I, I want us all to expand our vision of the meaningfulness of the law and the gospel for the Houston area, for the United States of America, for the Western world, for the whole world. And try and capture, capture a vision of what, it, what the kingship of Christ means and the sovereignty of God means for all of life and all of the world. That's all. Amen. So with that, let me bless you. And we are out of time. And I apologize for holding us a little late. Um, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we ask your blessing upon us that you will enlarge our vision um, and, and enlarge our vision of you, uh, your work in our lives, the, the, the grace that you have reckoned not only uh, as our righteousness, but Father, the, the, the kingdom that you have that, that should be expressed here on earth as it is in heaven. And so we do seek that uh, through the blood of Jesus. And I ask your blessings on all who hear this message. Bless these gentlemen and their families. And thank you for bringing them to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.